Well, hey, good evening. Welcome to the uh, Wednesday night Bible study hour uh, here at Beacon Baptist Church. We're so glad to have you. It is October the 7th of 2020. Hard to believe it's already October. I hope you have enjoyed uh, your fall so far. And uh, again, we're so glad to have you with us here this evening. I think personally, fall is uh, my favorite time of year. I love the changing of the colors. When I was a kid, I always loved sweatpants, and I called it my sweatpants season. And uh, things have changed a little bit, and, uh, but always, always have enjoyed this time of year. Love, uh, as I mentioned, the colors, the changes, and for some folks, the smell of pumpkin spice latte. Now, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not into it. I love the smell of it, uh, but it's not my favorite thing. So uh, if it's yours, God bless you. There's a lot of folks uh, who live there and I just haven't got into it. Maybe I, maybe I have the wrong mixture. I need to get a better uh, mixture together. But it's good to see you. Thanks for being with us here this evening uh, for our Bible study time. Just a few reminders as we get into this. Uh, tonight is our first night of doing our ABS classes, which simply just means our adult Bible study groups uh, here during the Wednesday night service slot. And uh, we are so excited um, about this great opportunity here and uh, moving forward uh, for the Lord. This coming Sunday, um, we are going to have the Jeremiah Hart family with us. And they sing, and uh, he uh, is an evangelist uh, for our church anniversary. 72 years uh, will be celebrated this coming Sunday. And I know you'll want to be here if you're able to. Everything starts at 10 a.m. We're going to have a lunch on the grounds afterwards, uh, picnic style. Bring your own picnic. We'll have a few food trucks set up out, out there. We're doing it COVID style, you know, this year. And just trying uh, you know, our best to try and uh, meet everybody's needs, you know, across the board there. And uh, what a great joy that uh, it will be. And uh, which brings up every Wednesday here at Beacon, we have what we call the Others Offering. And it's just an opportunity uh, for you and I to give back to special causes uh, for the uh, Lord's work. And uh, tonight, uh, you can go onto our website, beaconbaptist.org. Uh, you can go to the app. Uh, you can even go through Facebook, and, uh, or you can even text uh, GIVE to our text number. And uh, you can just uh, go there, and any offering you give tonight, uh, you can designate for the Hart family. And I know it'll be a great blessing to them, help cover their expenses as they travel in and all those kind of things. I know it'll be a blessing to you. If you have your Bibles, please go with me this, uh, this evening over to Titus chapter number 3. Titus chapter number 3. I'm get there myself. I did not mark it this time. I usually do. And uh, sorry about that. Again, I hope you've had a good week and uh, hope things are going well. Uh, your way, hope work's going well, or uh, whatever it is that you do, and uh, always very interested in knowing uh, what uh, folks choose for a uh, career path or a job path, you know. Um, some folks wind up on all kinds of, of sides of the job and career uh, spectrum, and uh, boy, I was in construction for years. I was talking to someone yesterday about my uh, very first job, uh, real job. Uh, I worked for a vending machine company in Cincinnati, Ohio in the money counting room. And I remember uh, one day I was talking to my boss, Miss Lo Louise Michaels, wonderful, wonderful lady. I love her and her husband, Dave. And uh, I said, now, Miss Louise, I was 16, maybe 15, something like that. I said, now, Miss Louise, I understand we're counting all the money uh, that comes in on the conveyor belts. I said, but what about the money that falls on the floor? We get to keep the money that falls on the floor, right? And uh, she said, no, that's not how, <laughs> that's not how this works. And uh, Boy, did I have a lot to learn. But I'm so thankful for those jobs and everything that they mean. Well, hey, if you've been following along uh, in our Bible study, we've been doing, uh, I guess you could probably consider it more of a, a topical series on biblical Christianity. Uh, the uh, book and material was written by Pastor Kerry Smith uh, in Connecticut, a wonderful man of God. Appreciate him uh, and his family so very much. And this entire study has just been fantastic. Uh, to be honest with you, in a day and time when it seems like so many things are blurred, doesn't it? I mean, it seems like from the media to the news to political parties to whatever it is, um, there's such a blurred line on what is right or what is wrong or what is preferred or how I feel or what's the principle of this or, or how can they both be right and wrong at the same time, you know? And, and there's such a blurred line that I believe has now over, the, over time crept into the Lord's church or even when it comes to Christianity as a label, if you were to label it that way, 
it can be kind of blurry. What, what, what does that mean? Um, you know, there was a day and time in, bi in biblical history when you said you were a Christian and you belonged to Christ and it meant something. And the world understood what that meant. Um, people understood, wow, those are little Christ. They are Christ-like. They are Christ's disciples, you see. And by the way, it was a world that called believers Christians first, according to the book of Acts. And as you begin to think about that, it has been our desire uh, to try and just rediscover what is true, biblical, authentic faith. Um, because I'll be honest with you, I want faith that crosses culture. I, I want a faith that breaks down all the barriers that mankind has created uh, with power, with religion, all these things. And I want to come find who Jesus is and truly learn all about him and understand what my Christian faith is supposed to be. Um, you know, is it a list of this? Is it this? Is it this? Um, and so it's been our desire uh, over these last eight uh, lessons to uh, better understand what real Christianity is truly all about. Now, in this format, I am in no hurry to uh, get through everything. I want to take some time. So I want to encourage you as I go through the lesson, uh, I'll say it now and I'll try and remember to say it again at the end. If you have any question, here's my email address, Eric Faust, E-R-I-C-F-O-U-S-T at beaconbaptist.org. And I encourage you to send any questions in uh, that, that you have, and we'll try and get those answered each week, uh, maybe about, about the lesson or some, something else. We can uh, dive into that for sure. But today I want to focus over in Titus chapter number 3. We will uh, get there in just, in just a moment. You know, my uh, kids and I and my wife, we all like to talk about snakes, you know, and how much we don't like snakes and prefer never to see one again. And in my family tree, uh, a lot of my family has come from a place called Rattlesnake Ridge, Kentucky. It's a thriving metropolis, I tell you. And no, it's not at all. Uh, but uh, so the talk of snakes and rattlesnakes and copperheads and cobras and rat snakes and gardener snakes, I mean, it's just a, a common occurrence uh, in our house, especially here in North Carolina. Uh, I, I love to mountain bike. In a lot of places I go, I've seen a lot of different kinds of snakes. I've seen a baby copperhead, uh, a bunch of uh, black snakes, and uh, all kinds of things. So the kids and I were talking the other day, and, and uh, my, uh, my oldest looked at me, and she said, Dad, I have, a, I have an important snake question for you. I said, all right, go ahead. She said, why should you never use a snake as a boomerang? I first thought, why in the world would you in the first place? She said, because it will always come back to bite you. <laughs> oh, it's so bad. That's so bad. Oh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I tell you, you can email me your favorite joke. I might tell it to you. But I just, uh, I, I enjoy silly things. That didn't really happen. We do talk about snakes a lot, but not in that regard. You know, growing up, uh, one of the things we've always enjoyed in our family is we enjoy, you know, pranking one another. And one of the things that we did growing up in our house there in Cincinnati is a lot of times my brother and I uh, would use rubber snakes and we'd hide them. You know, mom and dad's room would hide them around. And, it, and it's interesting because when you walk by a rubber snake, uh, <laughs> um, there's a struggle there, isn't there? Because you don't always know if it's, right, if it's real or if it's not. There's this fear that overcomes you. This uh, emotion drives your mind. And, and there's a battle all of a sudden that occurs and what is right and what is wrong and what is real and what is not. And our lesson today is going to take us down that similar path on, you know, now that we have this new life in Christ, what about our old flesh? You know, just because we're new in Him and God has given us a, uh, a uh, as the Bible says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be a new creature, or in, uh, it, I'm, I'm messing it all up, do you ever do that? If any man be in Christ, well, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And that is a true statement. And the reality is, though, yes, we have a new spirit and a new creation, but we still have to deal with this old flesh. And if you're a follower of Christ, a believer in Jesus, you understand that struggle. That sometimes it's hard to fight off the old flesh and it's hard to be led by the Spirit. So the question is, when you see that rubber snake, why do, your, why do our emotions feel things that our minds know are not true? Here's a question. Why do our emotions lie to us? You know, simply put, it is because we are more complex than you and I think. 
You see, our mind may know the truth, but our emotions, sometimes, actions, can work against it. Again, our emotions and sometimes our actions work against our mind. So here's the thing. You and I are more than a body. You are more than randomly evolved biological matter being swept along by spontaneous events strung together by fate and some kind of cosmic evolutionary process. Friend out there tonight, you are more than just an accident. Secular thought, though, has led us to be brainless and morbid when it comes to big questions. Self-help psychology tries hard to avoid truth because secular thought doesn't have solid answers to deep questions like, where did I come from? Why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? And where am I going? These answers that secularists provide for these questions honestly are hopeless. Secularists say you are randomly evolved biological matter, which is to say you have no meaningful origin, no intelligent purpose, no significant value, and no future, but nothingness. Who would agree that's hopeless? Secularists also say there is what? No God. That man is God. So worship the creature, not the creator. The conclusion is you are nothing, but you are God. You are the nothing God of nothing. Congrats. Do you feel special now? <laughs> I sure don't. You know, culture says you're just a sack of meat. So live for immediate pleasure because nothing else matters. Take the path of least resistance and immediate gratification. If it feels good, do it. Follow your heart, our culture says. Secular reason leaves us in a helpless state. Now here's the problem with secular reasoning and the mindset behind it. Consider this deceptive belief system breaks down with one word, conscience. Conscience. A man was consulting with a psychiatrist. He says, I've been misbehaving, doc, and my conscience is troubling me, he complained. And you want something that will strengthen your willpower, asked the doctor. Well, no, I was thinking of something that would weaken my conscience. <laughs> You know, randomly evolved matter doesn't have a conscience. Spontaneous evolution doesn't etch any eternal moral values in a sense of good and evil in a person's genetic code. Cosmic primordial soup doesn't give birth to life that instinctively desires to worship. You know, in every people group, in every nation, in every era of human history, from the most civilized to the least, you will find people what? Worshiping. Even the atheist worships. Who does he worship? Himself. By declaring there is no God. And here's the reality. Everybody worships. Everybody subjects themselves to a moral code that reveals the existence of what? Their very own conscience. Hence the existence of a moral authority. And who is that? We understand from the scripture it is God. So conscious is the knowledge of right and the knowledge of wrong. It is the internal awareness of moral absolutes. It is the intrinsic nature in us that calls us to worship. It's interesting. Let me read for you here in Titus chapter number 3. I like to begin there in verse number the Bible says this, without natural, oh, I'm sorry, wrong, Titus chapter 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and Renewing of what? The Holy, the Holy Ghost. Which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the eternal hope, uh, I'm sorry, the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto me. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and they are vain. And Scripture very clearly begins, uh, Titus here it challenges us to that real battle that exists. That, you know what, once we get saved, yes, we uh, have a new life, but we still deal with our old flesh. And our old flesh, just like when we see the rubber snake, sometimes it deceives us. Sometimes even though our conscience tells us one thing, our flesh still desires to lead us in another. Again, one of the things you and I must ask ourselves about is, why do I have a conscience? What is inside of me that is, that is desiring me to understand and have a moral code of what is right and wrong? Why is it our, our secular culture desires so much to defile and destroy the conscience? Because then I believe, as Satan understands, if you can destroy a man's conscience, that man may never truly hear with his heart and his ear the gospel of Christ. So as we begin down this road of this new life versus the old flesh, we're just going to study one of these subject matters here to this evening for time's sake, and we'll jump into the rest of it, Lord willing, next week. If you're taking notes not to tonight, jot this down, please. Number one, when we consider this, how do I balance this new life and this old flesh? Jot this down. Number one, you and I are a three-part creation. A three-part creation. Consider these scriptures. You see, God tells us the truth about ourselves in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God for your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we see there? What are the three parts we see in that verse? Spirit, soul, and a body. Notice with me in James chapter 2 in verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So then there's his body and spirit again. Consider with me 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So, again, here's this contrast. That there's almost, if you would, two lives going on, or there's a war going on between this new nature that when, when we become a child of God, when we get born again, we now battle this old flesh sin nature, you see. You see, these verses explain that you are made up of three parts in one being. A spirit, what? A soul and a body. It's nearly impossible to separate these three parts of being Absolutely, especially the soul and spirit, as they are very uh, intricately connected and interwoven, and the words are sometimes used interchangeably in the scripture. So the simple point is this, is the Bible will constantly, from beginning to end, by the way, it's a beautiful picture of who God is, because he's three in one, of how mankind is, a body, soul, and spirit is interwoven. By the way, isn't it interesting, when it comes to a triune God and a triune being, it's not, it's not necessarily the lesson, but it's just interesting. Satan is a master imposter. And when you get over to the book of Revelation, you begin to see how his evil begins to unfold on the world stage. There's a satanic trinity that also takes place. By the way, Satan never has, has any new tricks. It's always the same since the Garden of Eden, you see. Anyway, back to our subject matter. So again, Eric, why is it important we learn this? Why is it important we realize the differences? Well, let's find out. Number one, let's study this out. So we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. What does that mean? So your body is what some would call your earth suit or your flesh suit. Uh, you feed it, rest it, exercise it, care for it, nurture it. When sick, you take it to the doctor. When hurt, you mend it. When needy, you try to fill it. And when it dies, you exit it and continue existing apart from it. Kind of interesting, I have on my uh, sport coat here today, and you know what? This sport coat, is it's a great coat. Just got it at uh, Kohl's this week, 80% off. Come on, great sale. 
But the jacket itself honestly is nothing. It's just a sport coat. It can look great in a closet, but what does it need? It needs a body to fit on, right? And our flesh, our body is the same. It's that same kind of idea. It's the sport coat. It's the outside. You see, over time, your body ages and it breaks down. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, that, uh, let me read it for you, in verse number 2, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed, uh, uh, clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. For we that are in the tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. The morality might be swallowed up of life. And what Paul is basically saying is, listen, as, our, as he likened it this way, that our body groans over time. It gets old, falls apart. You, for me, I found out, you know, not too many years ago, I went from a forehead to a five-head. Man, it's starting to go back. Uh, my wife mentioned the other day, she said, boy, you're getting a little bit more wrinkly, you know, up in, uh, up in this zone right here. And uh, uh, but it's just a natural part of life. You know, one of my teachers in uh, eighth grade at Bridgetown Middle School, uh, he's a, he, he's a um, MMA fighter. Uh, he's, he's semi-retired, I guess you could say now, and a wonderful man, Rich Franklin. And I remember Rich Franklin saying, I never really met many Christians in my school growing up, and that, that at least I knew of, or maybe I just didn't care, then either because I wasn't saved. But I remember Rich Franklin always used to say, he used to say, see y'all tomorrow, good Lord willing. And just that, even as an eighth grader, hearing the reality that, man, there's a chance I may not be here tomorrow, um, you know, for whatever reason. But the truth is, our body does age. It, it breaks down. I'm, I'm 36 years old, and uh, I'm starting to feel a little bit here and there. So, again, we're made up of three parts. Number one, it is the body. I can almost hear you say it on the other side of the camera. Fantastic. There's a second one. That is a soul. Man, you got it. You got it. So, what's, what is the soul? Well, your soul is the inner you. It, it what occupies your body. It's your mind. It's you and my will. It's our emotions. It's oftentimes what the Bible refers to, our heart, you see. This is your thinker or your intellect. Your chooser, that's your will, and your feeler, that's your emotions. So, let's just go over that once more. Your soul is what? It's your intellect. It's your will. It's your emotions. You know, with a thinker, a chooser, and a feeler, your soul is quite complex. It's the, it's the sum total of your inner man that processes and wills you forward through every experience and through every relationship. It's your personality and your uniqueness. The real you is inside of this suit of flesh, you could say. That's why in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, the Bible says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. I love what Psalm 139 and verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Because God understands that your emotions, your mind, and your will need to be in direct line with God. He needs to make sure he can filter himself and he can teach you the word of God and it will grow in there. But again, so we have a body, we have a soul. Number three, we have a spirit. Now, the spirit is the source of your deepest being. Before salvation, this was essentially yours and I's sin nature was spiritually dead to God. This was your sinful root system that was fallen and could not come to God. The Bible calls this our old man. Your source, your spiritual genetics were proficient at producing sin. You know, after salvation, your old man is crucified with Christ and is completely dead. Now, remember, this is not a behavioral thing. It is a biblical thing, you see. You may not feel like your sin nature died, but it did. Your new nature is alive to God, which, make you, which, which makes you his new creature. And your spirit is reborn and made new by your faith in Jesus. God's Holy Spirit is now within you, enabling your new nature to know God and experience His grace trans and transforming presence in your life and in mine. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, 
that we might know the things that are freely given to us by or to us of God. God desires for you to be led by His Spirit in all of his, all life. The Holy Spirit is within you to dictate truth to your soul, to your mind, your will, and your emotions. He desires to anchor your thoughts, emotions, and choices, and direct them accordingly. He desires to lead you into a behavior that is like Jesus and in line with, as the Bible says in Philippians 5, or chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. He wants us to have the mind of Christ. How does that happen? The Holy Spirit of God comes in and he lives within us. You know, as God's Spirit leads us, or leads our new nature, it directs your soul, which then uh, dictates to the body how to act or behave. It's a top-down approach to living that flows from God's Spirit within, and God's Word calls this walking in the Spirit. Now, let's, let's back up for just a second. I'm going to give you an illustration, and we'll be all done for this evening. So we started off our lesson joking a little bit about rubber snakes and how when we see one or something scares us, there's a part of, our, uh, a part of us that says this isn't real. There's another part of us that takes over. There's another part of us that tries to convince the other part of us that this isn't real. It's just fake. I'll, I'd like for you to consider this illustration as we close here this evening. Now, think back to whenever it may be that you were afraid or, or what, what you're afraid of. But know in your head that you shouldn't be. Consider the three parts of your being can break down and consider how the three parts of your beating uh, of your being can break down and mislead you. For sake of illustration, again, let's think of the man who's afraid of the rubber snake. First, his spirit knows the truth that should make him free from fear. Sure. He should be able to walk right past it and tell his mind, will, and emotions it's fake. Forget about it, right? Well, second, his soul, his mind, will, and emotions should process the truth with a calm, emotional response. Intelligent thought, that's not a real snake, and then make a reasonable choice. Third, his body should obey and then make it happen. Keep walking. Don't experience any physical or emotional response toward that rubber snake, right? But when caught off guard, that may not be what happens. You see, the, grow, the soul grasps immediate control. Mind, will, and emotions do an emergency override of truth and of spirit. And it happens so quickly that he doesn't even realize that his emotions are calling ridiculous plays now. Here's what it looks like. First, spirits get, first the spirit gets shut down. Truth is irrelevant. Urgency leaps right over truth. Second, Emotions declare a snake emergency. Mind responds with Ill illogical facts about snakes. Emotions respond with fear and paranoia. Third, body responds with adrenaline released, increased heart rate, heightened nerves, and spastic reflexes. You know, in this case, when it happens, it's funny, sure, if it, if it is us. We usually laugh at, uh, uh, we usually, uh, laugh at ourselves later. But on a much larger scale, this process is far more destructive. When we ignore truth and follow feelings, we do not, or we do so, into disaster, into regret. And so I just want to ask you and leave you with this thought, the way we react, how all of those different scenarios play out, which moves truth, which puts our body in a different position, which puts our mind, our heart. All these things happen so quick. And if you and I are not careful, that's what our Christianity will become. Truth isn't relevant. The Bible isn't really that important. Well, my church, my pastor, my feelings, my political, and all of a sudden, truth has lost its ground. Now, here's the reality. Truth never left. We left truth. And so as we begin to dive into this, we have to understand if we're going to battle our old nature on a day-in and day-out basis, we got to understand how our body works. we got to understand how our, how our soul and spirit and body work together because the more we understand that, the more we can put those into the submission to God each and every day. And so, hey, this morning, or sorry, rather this evening, I hope you've enjoyed the first part of our lesson kicking us off here, uh, getting us into this, into this uh, concept of new life and verse the old flesh. 
I encourage you, uh, send me an email, E-R-I-C-F-O-U-S-T at beaconbaptist.org. Eric Faust at beaconbaptist.org. If there's any questions you might have, otherwise, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We hope we get to see you here in person soon. God bless you. We'll see you soon.